All right. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. And I'm sure you're aware this is our last week in the, our sermon series on the life of Elijah. It's fun for me to see these series begin and wrap up with you. Uh, next week, Phil's going to preach again. Very excited about that. And then we're going to kick off the Gospel of Luke. And that'll be perfectly timed for Advent, but then we'll keep going through and we'll see how far we get in 2021. Probably do a different series for the summer, but we'll start working our way through a gospel. I'm excited about that. I've enjoyed going through the Old Testament with you, uh, two different series. So let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. We're just going to do the first 15 verses, and then I hope you'll read about Elisha's ministry and life on your own. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah said, took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And, Elijah, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, merciful God, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Open and illuminate our hearts and mind that we may better understand your word and apply what we've understood to our lives. That we may better reflect Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the huge things that I haven't heard a lot of talk about, maybe you have, it just kind of came and went because it got easily rescheduled from this past summer, is the Olympics. Anybody missing the Olympics? I mean, I, I love watching. I do kind of OD. They're like, there's too much at some point. 
but I really get into certainly certain events, and I love having them. So I, I'm hoping they're happening next year. And it always kind of fascinates me when you think about an Olympic athlete who has trained most of his or her life for this event, this one event, or maybe multiple events, and really like full-time job for the years leading up to the Olympics, and how devastating it must be when they don't qualify or don't make it. I mean, it's, it's a job, right? And it's an honor just to be included, you know, to be able to tell people for the rest of your life, well, I tried out for the Olympics, you know. Wow. Um, but man, I think these are some competitive people. They want to win. I remember uh, there was a sprinter from Baylor University, a couple years older than, than Kath and me. Uh, and I, I'm sure you remember him, Michael Johnson. He had the gold shoes. Phenomenal runner at Baylor. 1992 was going to be his first Olympics in Barcelona. The night before one of his trials, he got food poisoning. Didn't qualify. I remember hearing that because he was the Baylor athlete that was going to make it big, right? Well, he can't. thankfully, he came back in the 1996 uh, Olympics. That was in Atlanta, right? And he shattered the, uh, what was it, the 200 meter. So that was exciting. Um, another really disappointing moment, I don't know if you remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the U.S. women's 4x100 relay team. They were so favored to win that it wasn't a matter of whether they would win or not, it was by how much they were going to win. You remember? And uh, But what's interesting about a relay is it doesn't necessarily matter how fast you are if you can't hand off the baton. And the women dropped the baton in the middle of one of the heats, didn't make it to the finals, were crushed. And then the same thing happened to the men's relay team. Races are won and lost in the transfer of the baton for the relay. And so that's a picture I want us to get as we start into today's passage. As we see Elijah handing the baton, in a sense, of his prophetic office to his young protege, Elisha. All right, I, I'm sure I'm going to mix up one of their names, so give me a little grace. I'm going to try to get those Elijah, the older, Elisha, the younger. Let's get those straight. Um, and we'll see that you know, there were many prophets. They're standing around, right, saying goodbye. And they, they, any one of them probably could have stepped into Elijah's place. But Elisha was the one that God had prepared. Um, and so we'll follow Elijah to the end of his life. And uh, he'll get a blessing to propel him into ministry that Elisha will. I'm already mixing them up. Um, and I think what we'll also see is the human side of these things, is that the prophets share a deep friendship, and, and there's grieving when they part. But ultimately, there is obedience to God's call. And so we'll see how, so we'll see how that picture of handing off the baton applies to us today as well. So, in the first six verses, we get a real sense for Elisha's devotion. All right, so the first point is devotion. Uh, I don't always do this, but they're all, all the points start with D, kind of getting to be a real preacher or something. Um, Elisha's devotion. Let's read those first six verses again. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. 
So the two of them went on. I have a friend named Doug who was a pastor for many, many years. And he started his pastorate in Minnesota as a young man. And there was a local pastor, a little bit older, who reached out to him and invited him out to get together. And at the end of their time together, the older pastor offered to uh, to continue to pray with him and talk about ministry together. Uh, he, was, he was gently suggesting uh, his willingness to mentor Doug. But Doug was young, and he was in the PCA, and this guy was a Reformed Baptist. And so in his arrogance, and he called it arrogance when I heard him tell the story, he didn't feel like he could learn much from this guy. And so he politely declined. And he missed a chance to be mentored by one of the giants, true pastoral giants of the last 30, 40 years, John Piper. He told that story to remind us that we should be looking for people to mentor us. Elisha did not forego his chance to be mentored by an older pastor, prophet. He followed Elijah, learned everything he could from him. The, the text doesn't really say this, but a lot of the commentators I saw estimated that they spent 18 years together. And I don't know quite where they get that, but um, that's a long time to grow close to someone and to be influenced by them. I would say, if you don't like some of the ways that I pastor this church, the way that I approach things or conduct business, you have someone that you can conveniently blame. His name is Dr. Dave Silvernail. <laughs> He's the senior pastor that I served under as an associate for 18 years back in Virginia. But you also have to give him credit for anything that I do well. <laughs> I'm just highly influenced by his, uh, consciously and subconsciously, by his ministry, the way he conducted his ministry in his life. And I owe him a huge debt of gratitude uh, for helping shape me as a pastor. We find out in verse 3 that everybody who was in the know, and they, they're called the sons of the prophets, that I think is just a way of saying the, the prophets who are training, they've had it revealed to them that God was taking Elijah from the earth that day. Elijah apparently wanted it to be a private moment between him and the Lord, and, and so he, but Elisha was so loyal, he didn't want to leave him, and so they, have this, they had this back and forth three times where Elijah told him to stay, but Elisha says, no, no, I'm, and he swears an oath, I'm going to stay with you. And I, let's just stop right, let's just pause and think about that, I mean, beyond the fact that these guys are prophets and that this is scripture and, and take, take away this kind of the formality and spirituality. Just Can we just look at these two men who loved each other, who encouraged one another? I'm reminded of the first fel the Lord of the Rings movie, Fellowship of the Ring. I don't know if it was in the novel. I didn't go back and check. But at the end of the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, um, most of you familiar with that? I don't have to go too deep into the plot. Good. Okay, so the end of the first movie, there's a scene. Uh, the fellowship has been formed, and they're taking Frodo in the ring to Mordor, but the orcs attack. And so everything's chaotic, and Frodo slips away. And he decides that he's going to go to Mordor by himself. He's even uh, ditched his best friend and protector, Samwise, Sam. Um, because he just feels that, that the path is going to be too hard, and he doesn't want to risk other people's lives. And so he gets in a boat, and he starts rowing away. But as he's rowing away, Sam tracks him down, and he, he runs out to the water. And, and, and Frodo says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. Of course you are, and I'm coming with you, Sam says. And so Sam starts swimming for the boat, but he can't swim, and he starts drowning. And Frodo reaches and he pulls him into the boat. I made a promise, Mr. Frodo, a promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Ganji. And I don't mean to. And so they embrace. And they start rowing. And they go to Mordor, just the two of them. Do you have a friend like that who will see you through thick and thin? 
who will refuse to leave you even during your dark moments. I mean, I think those of us with spouses, that person is going to hopefully see us through. Uh, Certainly we can count on parents and siblings and children, but we need that in our friends as well. And maybe even more than having a friend like that, are you a friend like that, like Elisha was? Back to the text, what was Elijah doing, stopping through Gilgal and Jericho? Those are the three spots. If he knew God wanted him to get to the Jordan. I think he was saying his last goodbyes, right? And, and there's a possibility these are very significant places in his life. Some of the commentators suggested that. Um, but certainly there was uh, these schools of prophets that Elijah wanted to see at the end. Chuck Swindoll summarized it. He said, historians tell us that the schools of the prophets were located at Bethel, Gilgal, and Jericho. These were the early seminaries where young men were trained to undertake the sacred calling, the disciplined lifestyle of a prophet. So one reason for Elijah's unusual journey to the Jordan was his desire to meet one last time with the young prophets in training and offer final words of encouragement to those who would carry the torch of truth after his departure. It's funny, at each stop you, you get this, uh, so the, the prophets wanted to make sure Elisha knew what was happening, right? And he says, yes, I do. Shut up, enough. Leave us alone, I guess. But they were there to support both men and, and carry on the ministry as well. So then in the last moments that are shared by the two men, Elijah hands his protege a blank check of sorts. So that verses 7 through 10, we're going to see Elisha's double portion. So the double portion, let's read that. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. Elijah parted the Red Sea with his cloak and the two men walked over on dry ground. What does this remind us of? We just studied the Exodus, right? Moses taking, uh, parting the Red Sea and taking the children of Israel too. And there's, there's this sense, the two men who appeared to Jesus on the mountain during the transfiguration that the Gospels record, Moses and Elijah, are, there's this link here. There's a lot of parallels. I haven't necessarily fleshed them all out as we've gone through, but both, both of the men confronted the kings of their day. Both took on the false prophets. Uh, both went to Mount Sinai to talk to God, had to hide their face. There's, there's a number of parallels there. And actually, I want, I want you to just like set that aside. We're going to come back to that idea of Moses and Elijah being uh, linked here because it's going to give us some more insight into Elisha. Elijah gave Elisha a chance to ask anything of him, right? He says, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. I hope this triggers something in your mind too. Someone else was offered. Remember King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. God gave Solomon a chance to ask him for anything. And what does he ask for? Wisdom, right? He says, I... I'm young, inexperienced. My, my, my father, David, was a great king. I don't know what to do. Give me deep understanding. An understanding mind is actually what he asked for. And God is, was pleased by that and gave that to him. Elisha asked for something a little different, but maybe it's connected. He says, a double portion of your spirit. Is Elisha asking to be twice as great as Elijah? Now, a double portion of 
the inheritance is what they called the eldest son's share back then. It signified that he would be taking responsibility for the whole family and the land and everything from the father. So Elisha was asking for the inner resources to be Elijah's successor. Is this maybe an improper thing to ask? Is is he asking too much? Should he have been more modest? I don't think so. I I think it's the exact opposite. I think he's admitting, I need the Spirit. I need the Lord to strengthen me for this task because I can't do it without His power. Because it would have been arrogant of him to say to Elijah, no, I'm good. I don't need anything. Go ahead and die. I think I'll do a great job without you. I don't need anything. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. It's always good to remind ourselves that we're not up for the task. We're not up for the battle without the Lord's strength. But we have God's resources and His gifts available to us if we will humble ourselves and ask. Now, Elijah was not totally sure if this could happen. Did you catch that? You've asked a hard thing. And he essentially says, if God allows you to witness everything that's about to happen... Then, then it's going to happen. Then you'll get the double portion of my spirit. But the, I think the, the opposite was true. If Elisha was not able to see what happened in the spirit world uh, when Elijah was taken away, then maybe he didn't have much of a future as a prophet. So in the next five verses, the, the moment arrived when the Lord was going to take the elder prophet away. Elijah's departure, the last D, the third point, departure. Verses 11 through 15. Read those again. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, They said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. That's that's the song that I think probably springs to a lot of people's mind as you read this. It's interesting if, if you listen closely, read closely the text. It doesn't say that Elijah actually got in a chariot. Right? He said, it said the chariot and the chariots and the horsemen separated the two, and a whirlwind caught up Elijah. Maybe it's implied that he got in, I'm not sure. It's worth asking, why are Elijah and Enoch, back in, in Genesis 5, the only two people who never experienced a natural death, were just taken up into heaven? I have no idea. Please ask the Lord when you get to heaven why that is. I, I do know that Elijah's being taken up in glory through the clouds is quite the contrast to the death of Ahab and Jezebel who were essentially fed to the dogs. Right? Elisha was so grieved by Elijah's departure that he cried out and tore his clothes. Uh, but then he took up Elijah's cloak and then he parted the water as well. It was kind of a test or a sign that God was with him, that both he and the the prophets that were on the other side, they witnessed. And remember I said, remember the parallels there, because this is a a parallel to Joshua. We all remember that Moses parted the Red Sea, but Joshua parted the Jordan River. 
at one point. So here, Elijah had parted the water on the way out. Elijah, Elisha parts it on the way back. He is a successor in the mold of Joshua, in the similar way that Joshua succeeded Moses. And since he had seen everything that had gone on, the prophets didn't. Nobody else saw this. Elisha got to see how Elijah ascended. He was given that double portion of the Spirit, and all of the other prophets recognized that that Spirit rested on him now. Now, A.W. Pink, a a commentator, pastor, uh, many years ago, made the claim that Elisha's ministry lasted twice as long, and he did twice as many miracles as Elijah, at least that were recorded in the Scriptures. So maybe there's something to that. Um, I would encourage you to read the next 11 chapters on your own and and read about Elisha's life. I think what this is pointing to in a greater way, though, is Jesus' ascension to heaven. Clearly foreshadowed here in Elijah's departure. Turn to Luke chapter 24, if you would. Luke 24, 50 through 53. Give you a second to get there. If you want to put a finger in John 14, I got a couple verses from John 14 too. So, Luke 24, this is after Jesus' crucifixion, after his resurrection, after appearing to his disciples, there were 500 people, Paul said. Verse 50, then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Yes, Jesus died once, but he defeated death. And God raised him from the grave, and then he did not experience death a second time. Right? All the other people who were raised from the dead in the Bible, people like Lazarus, died naturally a second time for good. But like Elijah, Jesus was carried up into heaven. He returned to his glorious kingdom where he had spent eternity before coming down. And as the Apostles' Creed states, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. He sat down at the right hand of the Father because he had finished his work, right? He had lived a perfect life of obedience in his human body. He had taught the world the ways of God's kingdom. He had healed everyone that he was sent to heal. He would train everyone who he was meant to train. And then he had endured a painful death on the cross. He had died as the substitute in place of every Christian believer who would come to faith in him and had taken on their punishment on the cross. And then God raised him from the dead, brought him into heaven, restoring him to his seat of honor. And now it was time for his people to carry out their work, right? The ascension and the people there, it's it's a picture of the people who were trained to do ministry standing there and Jesus, in a sense, leaving them with the baton of ministry. He was handing everything to his disciples, his followers. Turn to John 14, because before Jesus ascended, he had promised his disciples, that he would leave the Spirit with them to help them accomplish their ministry tasks. So verse 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Skip over. He dwells with you and will be in you. And after Jesus is gone, he he promised the disciples they would do greater things than he had done. So verse 12, back up a few Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. In 1945, when Harry Truman was the vice president under Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was summoned to the White House, 
And he didn't know about what until he got there. And he was told, the president has died. It was Roosevelt's fourth term. I don't know if you remember. Um, And so he found Mrs. Roosevelt. And he offered his condolences and said, is there anything I can do? And her reply was, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. I love that. The presidency was now his. He had inherited it upon Roosevelt's death, and he had the work to do. And that was Elisha's situation after Elijah's departure. That was the disciples' situation after Jesus' departure. And it should give us a picture about how we should feel about our lives. Not that we're the president, (laughs) but that we are the ones doing the work of representing God on earth. I think even more than the results of any election, it's much more important who the next generation of Christians, Christian leaders are going to be. We go, we do His work in the strength that He gives us, guided by His Spirit, empowered by being united to Christ. But we are the ones who are running our leg of the race. Right, We've been handed the baton from the last generation that came before us who took it from the generation before them all the way back to Jesus handing it to the, his followers. I don't know about you, I see a little picture of handing off the baton in this church. I didn't get permission, but James Chestnut uh, it was a pastor for 29 years before he retired. And he's still active, involved in ministry and worship. You see him involved here. But I see a a little bit of a handing off. I mean, I didn't know him before I came here, but I'm in my mid-40s, okay, late 40s. Um, And what I see is the, the middle of my ministry career. And then I look to Phil and to Betsy, who are in seminary right now. And I see the people who I'll be handing the baton to, right? Uh, Phil is training to be a pastor. Betsy's training to work with women in counseling. Um, Lord willing, those things will happen. But as I stress all the time, it's not just pastors who do the work of the ministry. All of us, all of you need to be thinking through your lives, your vocations, and your free time, your, your gifts, how you can be ministering to those around you, even kids, students. It's not too early to start to be thinking about how the Lord will use you now and in the future to impact the world for His kingdom. Always remembering that we don't earn our salvation when there's nothing we do that gives us God's favor God bestows His grace and salvation on us and then empowers us for the work. It, it, you may have heard this quote that Christianity is one generation away from extinction. There's some truth in that. I don't really believe it. I think it gives way too much uh, emphasis on us and too little on God's sovereignty. And, and we've seen in Elijah's life in the book of Romans that God always preserves a remnant, and his sovereign hand is guiding, etern- is guiding history and the growth of his church. But we are his hands and feet on the earth. We have to grab the baton, and, and we must also pass it on, right? Our lives as Christians are not just these isolated individual races. That's why we come together as a church body to encourage one another and to do team ministry, We've got to rely on our teammates if we're to accomplish the work that God has given us. So three questions before I end. Number one, are you grabbing the baton and running your leg of the race with us? Number two, will you be ready to hand off the baton? And number three, do you long for heaven? As much as I like the Swing Low song, there's actually another song, different song about Elijah that I love. And it's called Elijah. It was written by Rich Mullins, the guy who wrote Awesome God. You probably know that one better. This is the chorus. When I leave, I want to go out like Elijah. 
with a whirlwind to fuel my chariot of fire. And when I look back on the stars, it'll be like a candlelight in Central Park. It won't break my heart to say goodbye. Well, Rich departed this earth in his early 40s, uh, thrown from a Jeep, a car accident, um, didn't go out like Elijah. And none of us will unless we're here when Christ comes back. If you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, my last scripture, verses 16 and 17, reminds us, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. You may love your life. You may love being here on earth. But when the Lord calls you home, will you be ready? We have treasures and pleasures in heaven that we can't even imagine. It will just put this world... Think of your greatest vacation or or earthly experience that you could ever have. It doesn't compare to what we're going to experience in heaven. I can't wait to go. But like Paul, of course, I realize I have work here and it's not my time yet. God is not calling me home yet. But when he does, Lord, take me. I'm ready. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this series, these scriptures that we have examined closely, the life of a wonderful man, a man who was called by you to do some courageous things, who also hid in fear and was very discouraged at the time. So thank you that we can learn from his weaknesses as well as his strengths. But thank you for showing us the end of his life and how he was faithful to the end and how he prepared the next generation. All of these schools of prophets, but even discipling his mentor, or his protege, the, the man who would come after him and in a sense replace him, Elisha. Thank you for that beautiful picture of what we're called to. Lord, as we thank you and and glory in the salvation you've given us, may we also see the tasks at hand, the ministry before us, the ways that we can follow you, spread the gospel and your kingdom in this world. Give us your spirit, what you have, and your strength for those tasks. So that when our time comes, you call us to heaven. You'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we'll look back on a life spent in obedience to you. God, give us that picture and the strength to pursue it. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray.